it's me, Jilla Webb, your host of Walking with Porpoise. Here with my guests to help you develop your foundation of purpose and fine tune the four pillars of success, practice, performance, presence, and peace. Let's get started. Well, hey, everybody, I'm glad you're here and you are joining us for the very first podcast. I have a very good friend of mine on Mr. Tom Hurst, and I want to give you a little bit about his background so you know just what an incredible musician and uh, player and person this man is. And, And he's got lots of great advice for you and things that you'll want to consider. So let me start off by telling you he is Nashville based percussionist, educator, clinician and promoter. Tom's been supporting artists across the spectrum of popular music for 25 years. Whether it's behind the drum kit or playing ethnic percussion or putting together shows or feeding the homeless, um, teaching young aspiring musicians like yourselves, he's done it all. He's had an amazing career. And speaking of that, let me just tell you a few of the people that he has performed with. The Backstreet Boys, Gary Allen. Wang Chung, Easton Corbin, Chuck Wicks, Tiffany, Joe Nichols, Sister Hazel, Tracy Lawrence, Peter Noon of Herman's Hermits, Lee Bryce, Josh Thompson, and James Otto. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And if that weren't enough, for almost two decades, Tom served as a Disney staff musician where he performed thousands of shows and did Broadway-style pit work for regional theaters and cruise lines. Like I said, he's done pretty much everything a musician could want and hope to do. On the educational front, Tom's a University of Florida grad with a Bachelor of Arts in Music, specializing in ethnomusicology, as well as having a Master's in Music Education, with an emphasis in Jazz Studies. He's an adjunct professor, uh, applied drum set, popular music history, and Jazz Studies at Lee University and the University of North Alabama. Tom's also taught every level of music education, whether it's grade school programs, ensemble directions, private lessons, drum and bugle corps, or indoor or outdoor drum lines. He's done master classes and workshops for university and colleges, and he's been an adjudicator for over 10 years with the Florida Bandmasters Association. He assesses drum solos and ensembles and marching percussion, as well as jazz bands at both the district and state levels. Again, I'm going to say this a lot, as if that weren't enough, he's also the co-founder and owner and director of educational outreach of Infinity Percussion, Infinity Open, and Infinity A. And he produces a popular rock show in Nashville, Tennessee called Loud Jams, where all of these amazing musicians get together and they learn these incredible songs. I mean, musicians from everywhere, all kinds of different bands, all styles, all genres. They come together for this one night of music and entertainment and they play these amazing songs. And it is spectacular. If you haven't seen a show When the world opens back up, you need to go check this out because it's a great evening of entertainment. Remember, Tom Hurst presents Loud Jams. When you ask Tom who he is, he says he's a lifelong musician and music advocate. He still believes that one must be a perpetual student and always willing to try new ventures and never stop learning or improving. So with all that being said, let's not uh, listen to me yammer on anymore. Let's dive into this really cool interview with my good friend, Mr. Tom Hurst. So with all of that introduction, there's a million things for you to dig into. I'd like to really welcome uh, my very first, and thank you for this, my very first podcast guest, my friend, Tom Hurst. Thank you, Jill. It's an honor. I'm so I'm so stoked that you would ask me to do this because, you know, my respect for you and just my gratitude for our friendship. Well, same, same. It is very mutual, very mutual, my friend. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and doing this. Um, We're both educators. We're both um, musicians and working in the professional world. And the reason that I wanted to start this podcast was to talk to professionals in the industry to sort of not only get your take on what you're doing now, but how you started and, um, give the students of today, the young artists that are in college or maybe in high school and looking at this overwhelming it was seemingly overwhelming industry. And the qu- I get it all the time as a teacher, like, how do I, what do I do? Like, how do I start? Okay, I'm graduating. I don't know what to do. So 
let's um let's dive in to your career and tell us how you started. Well, I, I think it's the thing I know you and I, I felt like, you know, I'd known you my whole life. You know, Robert told me I would. He says, wait till you meet Jill, you're going to love her. And and it was like, I felt like, you know, you we both said it that day. It was like, oh, my gosh, like you're like my sister I never had. Be- because the fact that both of us, you know, I, I definitely did not grow up in the industry the way you did. But <laughs> but I had a little bit of that because my dad played drums. So there was drums were in the house as long as I can remember. Um you know, he hit in his case, it wasn't like your mom where it's a pro, you know, she, dad was purely a hobbyist kind of had always played while he went through college and you know, he was an engineer of trade. But that to me, I think that, and we, I think we've talked about this at times. It's always felt like it was just, I just sort of knew, and I wasn't one of these like, you know, oh, music, you know, my family nurtures it and everything. Nobody in my family, either side, other than my father that I know of, like, I'm trying to think of anybody that even played the piano or anything. I mean, there's like nobody played music. My mom's got like, five sisters and they're all nurses and, you know, in like professional world, we had more degrees than a thermometer in our family. Everybody's got a college degree, but like this music thing was not an option, <laughs> you know, dad just had do it for fun you know he jammed with his friends you know and they were like all of his engineering friends and they'd get together and play ccr tunes in the 70s that's my earliest memories of music in the house like a garage band yeah true garage band i mean his dad's except they weren't in the garage they were in the living room you know and and i i mean it's more i hardly remember that i remember seeing him play sometimes and dad wasn't i mean rest his soul he passed away when i was young but you know like he wasn't that good from what i can tell (laughs) but he did have two things. And I think this is a part that, and it's ironic that you and I met where we did at Troy and that I now teach at UNA because my grandmother was from Sheffield, Alabama. She, she grew up in Lawrence in Muscle Shoals. Dad, what little bit I do know of him, the little, I, I, I don't think I've ever heard an actual recording. I, I don't recall of anything of him actually playing. So it's just purely my own memory. But the one thing I do remember is his musical taste and everything. And just the album collection, he was a big, he really came from that kind of soulful, that white boy soul thing, you know, blue eyed soul. And he loved great rock bands that had a lot of soul, like Creedence Clearwater, you know, likes, uh, you know, the, of course, Zeppelin and that sort of blues based thing. And so, you know, for whatever reason, it's I, when I look back now, 2020 hindsight, it feels like it seems like there was kind of a calling. Mm-hmm. And I know you've got this a lot. I always have gravitated to the African-American community musically. Right. I just even when I was very, very young, all my best friends in elementary school, you know, the kids I hung out with were the guys who played in the gospel church. And that's who taught me to play drums. I, I didn't know anything. I owned the drum set was in the house, but my dad passed when I was six years old. And I just happened to tell my elementary school teacher, Mr. First, in like fourth grade, he was like talking about we had this really good drum set player, Jeff Boyd, but he didn't own a drum set. You know, he's he played in his church. And they're like, man, we need a drum set for school. And I'm like, raise my hand. Like, I have one. <laughs> I didn't know how to set the thing up, Jill. I mean, it had just been kind of collecting dust and it was all hodgepodge in a bed in an extra bedroom in my mom and my apartment. You know, this is the probably dad passed when I was about to start second grade. He was a a scuba diver cave diver and died in a cave diving accident and you know yeah i mean you know doing what you love you know he was 36 years old that that freaks me out here as i'm 52 oh, and you know but he, the you know it was the guy who did what he loved and very you know paratrooper race dragsters my god he was into everything i think it's where i get some of my other we'll talk about i'm sure <laughs> but, um but that was kind of the, the origins is like, I told my mom, I asked my mom, she called the school and talked to Joe first. And he was a brand new band director. I, he, ironically enough, this guy, Joe lives in Nashville. He looked me up about 10 years ago and showed up one night, you know, and here comes the guy who truly started me in music. I about fell over, you know, just the coolest guy. But he told me, he said, man, I was just out of UF. He had just graduated from University of Florida, got this job at Idlewild Elementary. He said, I didn't have a clue what to do. He said, this, the administration hated me. They did not. He said, I didn't think I was going to be there the next year. He says, and then you and your mom show up with this drum set. <laughs> And I was able, and he was a pop music guy. He's like, man, I, you know, I didn't really want to teach classical and I didn't want to teach little kids, you know, orphan instrument stuff. He said, I wanted to get kids excited about music. And so we started doing, he, he had us doing like a, in the 1970s, he had us doing like chic, you know, freak out, you know, and things like that. And Jeff, this kid was such a great drummer. I mean, in fourth grade, kid could lay it down, you know, playing Tony, Tony Thompson grooves. Right. And, and Mr. First said that it literally changed his career. He got known he way before his time, got to be known as this guy who used pop music to teach young kids and get them engaged. And the coolest thing, it was also very much a sociological thing because he's got 
we were being bused. All the white kids are being bused from way out West Gainesville over to East Gainesville. We're all coming together and we're having this great time yeah. and this is in the late seventies. So of course it's a wonderful, you know, from a standpoint of community building, you know, you got, you got these families that would never have known each other, you know, just, just the way it was, you know, in those times. And, uh, and, you know, again, my best friends still to this day, I, I, I lost touch with Jeff, but another guy, John Jackson, who I marched drum corps with, John was in that elementary school band class with me, another drummer. So, Long story short is that basically that's that those origins at Ottawa in fourth and fifth grade. And, and of course, since I brought the drum set, Jeff's playing it and stuff. I didn't, I was scared. I didn't know what to do. They're like, no, 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 you sit here. So I would sit there and bang on the four Tom next to Jeff while he's playing the groove. And I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I might've been banging out a rhythm, but my point of all that babble is that they actually, Jeff and the guys would take me to their, like I'd go over and hang out to play. And then I'd go to church with them on Sunday and go to the church and by now I'm wa I'm watching Jeff, you know, after a year or two and watching John and I'm like, oh, okay. So you do, you play on that, that hi hat thing. <laughs> and I started to mimic him. And I think what it was there, uh, the musical director at the church was teasing me. He was like, you sure you're not from our community? Kind of like, he's like, man, you got some good, you got good feel, little boy. And, you know, and so they always teased me and I, and I ended, they, I mean, my friends called me chocolates, you know, they're like, what was it? White chocolate or one of those kind of silly nicknames. And I ended up playing in a lot of like in particularly dance bands and stuff. None of my friends who played rock and roll wanted to play with me. Like as we got to middle school and high school, they wanted me to play Russian stuff and I sucked at all that. I couldn't yeah. do it. But but I could play like, you know, brick house. <laughs> and like and so I'll, and so I'd end up being kind of the token white guy, you know, in, in a lot of black dance bands. And that's how I really got rolling in, in high school when I was totally shunned from all my drumline buddies. You know, we, I could play in the marching band, but I was not a good, like, yeah. progressive rock. I didn't know how to play Van Halen, for instance. Well, you know, I mean, before we move off of this, because I think this is really important and really relevant right now, you said very community building. And I think music has always been about an inclusive community. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what color or what you have, what your beliefs are. Music brings people together. And I think especially in this time today, I'm so glad you said that because I think, how do you feel about today's artists? Is there a responsibility to, you know, help bring communities together in this way? Absolutely. I, you know, I think about it because I've never felt more I've, I've used I've said this many times through the years, you know, in different settings. I've never felt more welcome or safe and than I have in the African-American communities and Hispanic communities. You know, I, I look like a card carrying member of the Anglo. You know, I'm, I was blonde haired, blue eyed back then. All the things that, you know, some nut job like Hitler, some crazy like that. And I I was so welcome. They never judged me. They never, they, well, you know, welcome me in. And so at a very early age, I became staunchly aware, you know, excuse me, I, you know, I, I wasn't aware in those days. I'm like, these are my friends. I don't care. Right, they're, right. they're my bud. They don't care what color I am. But as I got older and you become aware of some of that kind of social strain, you know, and the in conflict, it's like, this is absurd. I mean, these are some of the best people I know, you know, I, I, and, and we come from such, you know, who cares what our socioeconomic, who cares? All I know is, you know, Jeff and John were two of my best friends. And to this day would be there, John would be there for me in a heartbeat. And, you know, I mean, John and here, and the other thing is there were, you know, sometimes the stereotypes are so stupid because you'd have John's mom, my friend, John, you know, they, you know, here he is, you know, he's an African-American kid in the seventies. Well, his mom had graduated from Harvard and she went on to like run a whole division for Merck. I mean, you know, it's yeah. not that there's any, exactly. I mean, there should be no, no, of course there, who cares, you know, yeah, where you're, right. where you're yeah. you know how it is. Yeah. The tendency to put people in boxes, you know, and I was also seeing it with my mom because my mom had been a school teacher, but after dad passed away, she, they had built our house before dad died, you know, him being an engineer, mom got really interested in that and she got into building construction. So she went back to school. At, uh, she already had her, gosh, I think mom got her master's in, in English from up at like Western Michigan, wherever she went, in Michigan State. But she actually went to our local community college, Santa Fe, and started taking courses, classes on like electrical engineering and things of that nature, mm -hmm. and got a job as a plans analyst for the county. Well, you can imagine against the late 70s, yeah. not a lot of new construction. No, no. And like mom then... She had an amazing boss who encouraged her. He saw how bright she was and how interested in her background with having built this home. He said, Carol, why don't you try and tell, you know, become a building inspector? So mom ended up being like the first female building inspector, one of the first in the country, definitely the first in Florida because they did all kind of uh, 
she got like TV 20, our local Gainesville affiliate did an interview with her. And, and, you know, you can imagine man going into in the night, late 1970s, going into a totally male dominated world. Right. right. Um, I'm watching her do that and I'm going to school and, you know, kind of growing up and we, and part of the thing, I'm glad people used to always lament busing and the, you know, crossing, you know, or I'm so glad I was part of that because I, I went from the elementary school onto my middle school, Howard Bishop, which was also kind of across town, so to speak. And again, predominantly more probably, you know, population was kind of split by the time I was there, but, you know, definitely known as kind of when I was growing up as more of a African-American black school right. versus some of the kind of lily white schools of Western Gainesville. I mean, just right. what it was. And man, again, band director, you know, awesome band director. Uh, I lucked out and get this guy Everett McCann phenomenally still. He's one of the super respected middle school director in Florida and he's, you know, runs our district still to this day. But, you know, same thing. Everett didn't see color. He didn't, couldn't have cared less. He saw great kids. Right. Know? And, and so I just feel really fortunate that at each point I had really, and so to answer, I have a long winded way to get back to your question. <laughs> you ask me what I see today. It just, I, I don't want to judge people, man. I understand that, you know, if somebody had pounded into my head when I was young, that that person's bad because they're a different culture, a different religion, a different color, I, I would probably spout the same party line. Mm -hmm. I just was lucky. I think it's important that, those folks that maybe do feel that way, I, I kind of feel like it doesn't do any good to bang them over the head, you know, and say, you're wrong and say, Hey, you know, can you hear me out here on this? I, I get it. it. Whatever it is you've been taught that you fear, can we just meet in the middle? And I, I would love for you to meet one of my friends from this community and, and you know, would you give them a chance? Cause I think that's the important thing. And so as when you said about artists, I totally get it. You know, people say artists, you know, oh, they hate it when, you know, Hollywood or musicians preach down to them. I, I think sometimes, I get that, you know, because I'm not a politician. I play drums. You know, I don't. I don't begin to my. I wasn't very good in my civics courses. You know, <laughs> so I, I understand. Say somebody who's staunchly one way or the other, whether super left, super right, centrist, whatever. You're, I'm not going to convince you, but I do think artists, when we have a platform, I admire the ones who use it for towards good. Like they're not trying to preach to anybody or change somebody's point of view. They're just trying to do good work and not just, not just musicians. I mean, I think I love watching what athletes do. I mean, oh, yeah. whether you like or don't like LeBron James, man, that yeah. guy pours money and, and time and effort into helping others. You know, and again, you know, I knew the second I would say that if this is on Twitter, I'd have 8,000 people attacking, you know, like, oh, you're so wrong. You don't know. And yeah, you're right. I probably don't know. Maybe there's bad things. All I can tell you is I've seen what the man does. And that's just one human. That's one. And there's my boss. You know, I'll say Tracy, man. You know, Tracy's a country musician. So you might think, oh, well, he does this or he hates this. I tell you what, Tracy has done more for, for homeless, for families. I, he feeds, I don't know how many families every year with the turkey fried. I think they... I think it, I know they, they prepare each year six to 700 turkeys and those, I don't know how many thousands of meals they make from those yeah. and how much money he raises for the Nashville mission. And he's been doing it for almost 20 years. They've expanded it to two other cities. Oh, I mean, right. and here's Tracy Lawrence, who's pretty unabashedly, you know, he's a conservative, you know, he's over here. So you cannot paint with that broad brush. I, I just don't believe it on either way. I, I guess for me, I want people to know that, Hey man, I am just in over here, you know, call me a tabula rasa for opinion, because I feel like as what we do, you do have to be empathetic. Mm -hmm. You have to be sensitive to what, the, you know, the needs of others. And I think you're just missing out, you know, if you don't, I mean, and I get it. There's, you know, there's artists on both ends of the spectrum who probably do not go by that. But the ones that like, I know you and I have always loved and admired mm -hmm. when you think about the greats, you know, I don't think about, I don't, you know, whether it be, I love like that Marvin Gaye addressed social issues. Right. But he also, you know, he also kind of walked his talk, you know, and you look at, you look at some of these great artists. I was just watching a thing on um, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, uh, there's a Netflix deal on them. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it was so fascinating to see some of the cultural components, you know, and like David Crosby, I mean, he kind of called BS on himself. He's like, oh yeah, you know, I, I was so full of myself. He says, but you know, I just, I, I cared. I hated to see others hurting. Yeah. And I'm like, man, that's at the end of the day, that's the thing is you can hopefully affect something positive, make life better for somebody else. And I think, too, for the musicians, especially during this time of COVID, I know that a lot of them are feeling, a lot of the younger musicians um, who are coming up, they're thinking, well, how do we do this now? There's no gigs. We can't make money through selling albums. Like, what do we do? We love this. I mean, you said you said this before, doing, and, and your father, too, doing something that he loved. You do what you love. I think if you do what you love, um, you know, 
but this is the point is that what do you how do you how do you do that now right and and you asked as you asked earlier like in terms of giving them advice i mean i know with both of us being on college campuses I'm always trying to be very candid with them. I'm like, hey, I don't have, I, I will be, let me preface all this with, I have no clue. I mean, I really, this, these are kind of unprecedented times. Mm-hmm. The only thing I can go on in my own life, you know, and you think about the, hey, I've been fortunate to live over half a century now, is that you, when things always seem bleakest is when complete revolutionary change occurs. Right. And, you know, I mean, we've been seeing it. You think about your students and ours. We were just talking about the fact of just their embracement of technology and the, how savvy they are. You know, I mean, I, I finally kind of stumble my way around in logic. You know, <laughs> I joke about it. I've always been such a technical dunce. It was just laziness on my own part, just not putting enough time into it because there are other things that were more interesting to me. Um, but I think that's the thing I try and say to today's, you know, if somebody's, you know, whether they're a teenager, early, you know, early 20s collegiate, or even if they're out. And also, too, those who maybe aren't going to school for music or something, somebody who's just, you know, working a job. I'm like, first off, don't ever feel ashamed for doing whatever you need to do to keep the roof over your head, lights on and food on the table. Well, that's got to come first, right? <laughs> and, and and you and I both know this. I know because we grew up in it. Yes, we did grow up in a generation where you probably, there, there, I, I would not argue, there were just more opportunities. I mean, people say that here in Nashville. They say, gosh, man, you know, back in the 90s, it was amazing. There was a showcase every night. There was, and it was, and there were less people. And it's just, you know, unfortunately, today's student or today's musician, aspiring or aspirant musician is coming along at a time where, yeah, there's just more people in it. Social media, I mean, the awareness. But that doesn't mean what I like what you said. That doesn't mean, you know, that you can't find a way to do what you love. You just have to. It just may not mean that you just just do that. I think the you know, I always say to them diversification, you know, we've the, right. all the jokes or the Jamaican joke. Oh, he's six jobs, man, you lazy bum. <laughs> you know, I mean. <laughs> It is that thing of you've got to, another as and as my little political aside, I always get a kick out of it when people are critical of other ethnicities about, you know, I mean, these people from Mexico, oh, really? Those people from Mexico outwork you, me and everybody put together. All my Mexican friends are the hardest working, most like solid families I know. I'm like, I'm kind of lazy. <laughs> you know? so you're not hearing me throwing that stone. But I yeah, I mean, more that's, jobs. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. And Jill, I think the thing is, it's like they're I. I I used to purposely work for Crew One here, who's a uh, they're a staging company, and in Nashville, and they they provide stagehands. I was doing that, you know, and again, I, this the way I, this sounds like I'm like virtue signaling or whatever that term is. I don't, I mean it literally. I wanted to remind myself how fortunate I was to be in the jobs I had where I did get to go play drums and ride on a tour bus and get paid pretty well and not really have to do all that much because I, I didn't want to forget the days when I worked construction in Florida, you know, when I didn't have a job at Disney World or I didn't have a gig and, you know, I'm out building houses, you know, and, and no shame in that at all. I'm just terrible at it. You know, I've got friends who are really good. I, I'm clueless. I was basically grunt labor. But I so here in Nashville, I worked lots of other things. I substitute taught in the schools and I worked for crew one as a stagehand. And a lot of my friends even that worked as hands that maybe were more production people, they just did it as extra money. And to, they did it for the same reason I was doing the connectivity. You get to connect with other people. You're working big shows like, you know, that are coming through Bridgestone and for them, they're going to land on maybe, Hey, you know, I hear you guys need a new, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, systems tech for your, you know, audio team. That's, they get it. They get on a tour. Well, me, I don't have those skill sets. I was genuinely doing it to a learn new skills, B of course, meet people, but C the important part to me was to keep myself reminded how lucky I am to get paid to play drums and right. that's not ordained right. <laughs> and whether it's play or teach. And so, that's the thing I come back to today's student and say, hey, look, you've got to be willing to diversify. Make sure you check anything else that you're passionate about. Okay, we know you like music. You got that. What else do you like in any capacity? Like you said, what are like or love? Mm-hmm. Is there a way to make a living doing that too? Because the music thing will not, I, I'm, some, I'm sure some would argue, but for me at least, I've found the more I diversify and the less I fixate on the door that might be closed right now, like for that student coming out, you know, like in our case, I remember talking to you a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. I so badly wanted to teach at a university. I kind of didn't really know how to go about it. I mean, I remember having that discussion when you were still in grad school and I already had my degree or right. got my master's, but I didn't know where to go ask because I, I would look at every school and go, oh, well, they've got, that's my problem is I know who they have. Oh, well, they've got Marcus Finney. He's amazing. Oh, they've got Jim Riley. They don't need me. So 
thankfully, Rich Redmond, God, you know, God bless him for being such a good friend. Rich was kind enough to refer me to Tracy Wiggins and I sort of landed in something. But, and my point of that being is that I wasn't, I just sort of was like, man, it'll take care of itself. Did the degree, just put good energy out there, let people know you're looking. And of course, you know, send your CV out and things like that. But you know, that falls on deaf ears a lot and things tend to find you. I don't believe in standing at that one door or fixating on it when there's all these others that might be open and the, you know, using the doors as an analogy for other avenues of your life that when you're over here focused on, you know, Hey, you know, for me, it might be my biking stuff. It's amazing how all of a sudden some bass player from artist X goes, Tom, man, I met you five years ago and I loved your playing. You know, are you available? When you do this session, that's how it always happens. Right. You know, and I mean, I, I can't say that for everybody. I mean, I, I mentioned Rich. Rich is so good about going and asking for what he what he'd like to do. And he comes in prepared and he comes in, you know, in, it's like we talk about uh, Rich Viano too. same way. They're they're going to be imminently prepared, but they know how to ask for the opportunity. But even still, you can't always make the opportunity. You can by all means put yourself out there. So I, that's why I say to students is like cast a wide net, you know, and I, I call it bulldozing. You know, it's like I try and have like all my right. all of out there and push. I'm not very good at any one of them, but I slowly push forward and it seems like something falls into the, into the maw, if you will, you know, and it keeps me working and I, it may not be where I thought I was going to be. You know, I always thought I was going to be Sting's drummer, but uh, I mean, I, I think Josh Freeze and Vinny have got, Kyle Uta have got that covered. <laughs> well, but you would have been great. You would be. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to think so. I keep trying. And then, you know, I watch those guys. And then, of course, Stuart you know, Copeland, I mean, he's my hero growing right. up. Yeah, I can it's kind of remember. Great thing cover, too, by the way, that you just put out. Oh, thank you. Uh, that was fun. I need, to, I need to be sure to link everybody to that, too. That was you and who else on that? Kevin Vonderhofen on, it's who really puts it together. My, you know, our, our buddy that, you know, is going to be doing some work with you, as a matter of fact. And, uh, you know, he's my, we've been playing together for 20 years. But he's Tracy's bass player, amazing harmony singer. He's like a high five guy. And Thank just, it, yeah. And, and the funny thing is, Kevin has always been, he's been like doing the, you know, these days everybody's got like a home studio, but Kevin was doing it when I met him. Gosh, he'd already been doing it in back in 2001, 2002 here in Nashville. Really just a fine producer. He just has, he's just got those kind of golden ears. He finds songs. I'm like, where'd you find this band? You know, he's always fine. Like I'm reading about Gator football and he's like over, you know, searching the web and he's found some amazing artists on Spotify or YouTube. So yeah, so that's Kevin. And then our, like one of my buddies of 20 years now, Michael J on guitar, who is also a great singer, songwriter and himself. He's the same way. I mean, I don't know how many albums Michael's produced in his own. He's got at least uh, six, seven. It might be more. Wow. I play some of his stuff and he's, He's kind of, he's one of my, as I call my little Gainesville mob, my buddies that I've conned into moving up here. <laughs> There's him, Chris Nance, you know, I bug them all. I'm like, hey man, come on up here, I'm lonely. <laughs> so, and, and you know, and that's, yeah. So Michael, Michael's done a couple of those with us. We've got another one in the can, a brand new Heavy's tune. Oh, um, cool. And it, it's, I think we're just waiting on the video editing and that's, uh, that features a uh, wonderful piano player, DeMarco uh, Johnson. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, and uh, Janelle Means, who runs Soul Vibes Collective up here. She's yep. an incredible singer. So it's, and I think, I'm pretty sure, I think Michael's playing guitar on it and then Kevin and I. So, you know, it's those little collabs, you know, that we do where everybody films themselves and records themselves. And then we, you know, Kevin puts together all the audio and a friend of his does all the video. Right. Well, I'll be sure to link all of that because it's fantastic. You guys do an amazing job on these things. It's really, really fun. So I want to, um, I, I want to, you talk about a lot about, you know, going out and connectivity. Another word for that people throw out is networking, yep. right? Um, so I really, I want to understand more of how that's done because I think that's such an important part of the, and here's the thing I think again, you're touching on that's so important is the process, not mm -hmm. so much the end goal, because like you said, a lot of times you don't know, you can't get to that end that you thought you were going to get to. But in the meantime, something else happens. And if you are prepared by working your process, by, by practicing or making the network connections or doing the things, just staying focused on what you can do every day, right. the thing comes to you. Absolutely. Well, and you know, I, I, again, it's not just to, you know, throw this back at you, but I mean, it's something I see you do constantly. I mean, it's one of the, I've told you, this is why I, so one of the things, I mean, beyond your humanity as a person, a friend and all that, but I mean, your diligence, you're always getting better. 
you're always getting better. I mean, we think about Robert Smith. He's always getting better. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think about anybody I know. It's because what I don't. I'm terrible with those. I always butcher all the sayings. But the the thing about luck and prepper is where preparation and something meet. Uh, yeah. I think about you know. I joked about Vinny's you know Vinny Kaliuta and Josh Fries that play for Sting. Well, the reason they're so available, you know, why they're landing in those jobs, they're constantly improving. They're some of the most gifted guys on the planet as drummers, and yet they also leave no stone unturned. I just read I read the book Robin Flans uh, who wrote for Modern Drummer and and, and uh, she did a wonderful book on Jeff Percaro, mm -hmm. you know, famous drummer. You know, mm -hmm. I, I thought I knew a lot about Jeff until I read that book, and Robin knew him all through his career. And they've been friends going back to like the, I think the early '80s, and you know, listening to here's Jeff who was born into a super musical family. His father Jeff Joe Percaro just passed away recently, but Joe was like you've heard him on a million movie soundtracks. He, sure. he, they're like the percussion guys, you know, yet here's this guy, Jeff, who grew up in this family, all of his brothers, they're, you know, they're all total badass musicians, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and you might have to edit out, sorry, my, uh, my <laughs> they're really good. <laughs> um, I think and, we're music people. I think we're okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going too off color. But yeah, and, and Jeff's whole thing was about constantly how little he thought of his own abilities. And this guy, everyone, I mean, gosh, he was playing for Sonny and Cher when he was 16. Oh. He was still in high school and then Sonny and Cher snapped him up to take him on the road and, and be the drummer on their show when they were huge. <laughs> right. You know, and so not to digress too far, but to come back to what you were saying about the process, I think that, you know, I'm a kid that again, like with my mom and dad, you know, I grew up on Parker Road in a trailer while they built our double A frame house out in the country, you know, in Gainesville, Florida. I, I had no clue about music. I didn't have a clue about what the heck I thought I would do, but I can remember standing in my shower as a little kid, you know, like, like taking a bath and I'd stand up and I swear I would pretend like, you know how you've got the bathtub shower and I'd pretend I was on stage. I didn't, <laughs> you know me, you, you know, you've worked with me. I'm trying to sing. I mean, I, I didn't think I was going to be a singer. I just kind of knew I was going to perform. Yeah. And it wasn't because I was so witty and clever and it wasn't because I was such a cute little performer. It was just like, I just had this gut instinct. Wow. So the one thing going forward, as I got older, I felt like, man, there's, I'm, I'm meant to be doing this. I'm not quite sure how I get there, but it seems like the one thing at every time, you know, whether, wherever your belief system is, I would always feel like, you know, in my case, I kind of feel like God would just put somebody in my life who just sort of inspired me, whether that was my friends, like I told you about in elementary school, you know, one of my other friends, Darren Hutchinson, he's a attorney, he teaches law at University of Florida. Now, Darren was the best percussionist, you know, heck, he's probably one of the best musicians at Howard Bishop Middle School. Could have gone on, done music if he wanted to. You know, my friends in high school, Brett Waterhouse, Brett's now, at, he's head of, I mean, he's the highest ranking enlisted at, the, in, at one of the big bases in Germany. He's about to retire. I mean, Brett was an incredible snare drummer, went to LSU on a full scholarship and everything. Yeah. But, you know, his military was his path. He went, you know, armored division, taught at West Point. And, you know, mm -hmm. I just, I feel lucky. I, I don't know, maybe Richie always says, Viano says this about me. He says, he says myself and my, and our, my partner, our partner with Rich, uh, John Campis that we do infinity with mm -hmm. like Tom, you and John are uh, he, cause you know, Rich, he reads a million books and it's all those books about people who tend to be connectors for others. Mm -hmm. he says, Dude, you were that. And I mean, Jill, I've always felt like you were that, you know, and ever since we met, I see the way you're connected in every different circle. And, you know, I think when you talk process and to network, to me, it's instinctive. It's like, I don't, I don't go out. Cause the one thing I always tell students, the one thing I don't want to be is disingenuous. Right. I don't want to come at somebody wanting something from them. I want them to know I'm like, and to a fault, I've had people actually criticize me about this, like not in a bad way, like Tom, man, you're missing out. You know, you should ask for the opportunity, like record recording sessions, for instance. Mm -hmm. I have a guy who hires me here, and my, he wouldn't mind me using his name, Mike Latanzi. He teases me all the time. He said, he says, man, to hear you talk, you know, he's New York. He's like, he, and, you know, he and Steve Vai, he used to run Steve's studio in L.A. So Mike's a yeah. very successful guy. <laughs> he was already using Rich Redmond, Near Z, you know, like the yeah. Chad Cromwell, all the usual suspects. And my friend Chris Nix re kept referring me to Mike. And Mike said, yeah, 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 I got some great drummers. He finally gives me a shot and calls me. And in the conversation, he said, all I did was like talk up all these other guys. And he goes, man, I thought you sucked. I figured this guy's like, he can't be very good if you're... <laughs> I was like, no, no, I was just Everyone else. I was just saying how much I admire what these guys do. You know, I've got I think I've got my own thing. I mean, I guess, you know, and, and it, but it made a good point. You know, and he eventually used me on a session. And he still does now. And and honestly, for specific things, he's mm -hmm. like, man, Tom, you've got your thing over here. Mm -hmm. But 
point of it of that of if the, if you're if the network the anything I would rather be passed over for opportunities and that to a lot of people seems like blasphemy but let people know that I'm authentic and that that my friendship with them is is coming from, is based in an organic place of not what they can do for me right like, you, know, you and I are friends first whether I know you you you're there for me any any day every day on Sunday and, and vice versa and it has nothing to do you know yeah we met because of the music but we're like wow you're awesome and there's that kindred spirit mm -hmm. so I think to when you refer to a younger person coming up is like is I'd say take some of the pressure off yourself just go be you find your place that you feel comfortable be around because I know too and I know you can relate to this Jill is I've been in settings where I tried to make myself fit in places where I was not comfortable mm -hmm. and it was authentic yeah, you're doomed. It's not going to work out. I mean, maybe, you know, some people can do it. Maybe some, you know, I, I you know, I, I get up watching Netflix and David Foster was talking about that. I watched his documentary, you know, and he said, he says, man, he's even said, he said me today. I don't know that I'd like a 25 year old me. He said I was cocky, <laughs> arrogant, pushy. You know, he was talking about it. And I said, you know, but I think with that, you know, that also he was working in Los Angeles in like, you know, pop production man I, I, you know that's a that's a pretty uh that's that's a, a deep you know competitive world oh. you, know, so, you know what i'm saying there's things where you kind of go you say to yourself like you know, i don't know that i would have that was never an aspiration of mine you know i i didn't say man i'd love to produce albums so i think you have to be you know, you're maybe gonna have thicker skin for that kind of thing well i think there's a, a pressure on people to I'm air quoting here for, you know, cause audio, right? People can for fitting in, right? You have to fit in and, but there's a difference I think between fitting in and like you said, finding your people, finding where you belong. Right. And for me too, I think that um, comes a little bit with knowing who you are and learning to be comfortable in your own skin. I, I totally agree. And I think both of us, it's why I so relate to you because we've probably taken more circuitous paths. I mean, mm -hmm. you as a performer, I mean, you know, and I have no, I mean, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I've worked with a lot of singers. I've, you know, I haven't seen anyone any better than you if, you, if we're making this a competition. You know, you're. As, well, thank you. But. But, but, you, but I also know you well to know that you're the last person that thinks that. Right. You're not interested in that. And you're also so interested in other areas of like, you're, you don't want to. Sure, you could, you could have probably just gone down that, just, and, you know, and we laugh. I love when we trade our pictures of our different projects over the years. I that the last one you saw it said it was awesome. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, Jilla. The mini, the mini Jillas. <laughs> and trust me, there's some, I, I need to share some of my early uh, early 90s uh, uh, Toms. <laughs> the, the, the rock years. <laughs> Great to have to look back on though. What I mean you know what I mean? That's it. And you wouldn't trade, man. I look back now and I'm like, gosh, I can remember at the time being on the road and like my rock band of the early nineties was called ISIS. <laughs> We've talked about this. What an unfortunate name. And it, and we're not even the cool metal band ISIS. This is ISIS. I mean, talented guys. I would never try. I'm not slagging it. Matter of fact, I learned so much from those guys. But you know, we're on the road. On the road. I quit my full-time job at Walt Disney World as a musician with benefits and all this so that I could go out and drive a 26 foot U-Haul that we had saved up to buy and with a van and then eventually we moved up to a Pacero motorhome and we played five nights a week in like a circuit rock clubs top 40 clubs all over the eastern U.S. from Miami to Michigan yeah. and but you know what man those three years on the road doing that I learned more about myself I oh I can't even count the nights I was like oh leaving the hotel stuck in some backwater town you know going to play four hours to nobody who cared you know but i learned more about myself as a human being about goals how to be creative and think of new ways what to, where i could improve myself how could i you know on the road bring things to do and and also to appreciate what a a, a, a day's work at any other job actually was look pretty darn good right. like, that's man, eight, eight you know eight to five or nine to five or whatever that, that's looking pretty good about now <laughs> And so the but what you said about about finding your place, I mean, I those those guys that were in and actually Gal, our, our lighting gal that traveled with us, she's a police officer in Kissimmee, and she actually came out to my gig like year before last, a big uh, a big country thunder festival with Tracy, and here I I'm like or she's an Orange County sheriff. Pam. And I was like, man, girl, you know, it's like, I mean, she's traveled up. I mean, we shared like eight of us to a hotel room. Oh yeah. I remember those days. <laughs> bags, you know, oh yeah, yeah, no, no, no. We just need one. No, it's just two of us. You know, everyone dives in the room and you know, and it's not even, it's, we're not talking like, you know, you know, courtyard bar Mary out here, <laughs> or, you know, Hollywood, Florida in some backwater dive. But 
I wouldn't, you learn so much about who you are and what makes you tick. And I can remember, I, I was genuinely questioning in the early 90s. During that period, I was thinking, man, this music thing, I, I don't know. And about that time is where I lucked out and ran, in, you know, ran into old friends from back in Gainesville, uh, Ken Block and Andrew Copeland, who are the founders of Sister Hazel. And, you know, Ken and I had played in like keg party bands in, in the 80s. And Andrew and I were in classes together. He was a football player. He like went to play division three football, some little college where he went, you know, I never knew Andrew could even sing. <laughs> I had no clue. <laughs> Turns out he had this gorgeous, you know, like high yeah. <laughs> Nobody knew. He's this big tough guy. You know, it was like, oh yeah, Kobe sang in church all through all growing up. And and so he and Ken started as a duo. And so I I was kind of burned out. And you know, I mean, I'm totally digressing here, but coming back to the network piece that I can remember being over in this rock world that I'd sort of fallen into just out of my desire. I'd, you know, I'd worked at Walt Disney World and gotten lucky landing in that. We can talk about that, but I, I just so badly wanted, I knew in my gut, I'm like, I'm supposed to travel. You know, this, this Disney job's awesome and cool. And I mean, it's so ridiculous because you got me out there playing with guys who've got like, I mean, literally guys who have doctorates from Florida State in music. And then there's Jethro, me, you know, playing bass drum in a group with, oh, one year, one year Santa Fe Community College. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the time, that was my educational background. So I just knew I could look at, even at that point, I was like round guys that I admired and, and enjoyed, but it wasn't where I felt like I was supposed to be. It just wasn't calling. It never has been. I've always kind of been on the periphery. Heck, I've done stuff for Disney off and on, even to recent years, but I just never truly fit in. I wasn't like the truly like I took lessons as a young child and then went right on and got my full scholarship because I was all state everything. No, I was not. I was like, <laughs> mediocre guy in the back of the band room, you know, couldn't read charts worth the darn, wasn't very good. You know, I was kind of a good snare drummer because I was cocky and aggressive. That's about it. <laughs> so the finding your place in that, that thing, the authentic piece, like I, it was, I can just remember coming home to Gainesville and somebody, I was home standing with my mom, just visiting, you know, from Orlando and somebody had reached out to me and said, Oh man, you ought to come down. Ken Block's playing this. They, they play uh, these acoustic gigs, you know, and I'm like, Oh cool. And go out and, I had already been playing, kind of getting in touch with my friends, Jack and Britton, the guys who eventually brought me here to Nashville years later. I was doing a little bit of stuff with them. And I think it was Jack who told me, he says, yeah, Ken and Andrew played here. And I'm like, Andrew who? He's like, Copeland. I was like, Kobe? He's like, yeah, man, he's singing. Okay. So I go to this little bar, you know, college bar. I'm down there and I couldn't believe it. And they were, they were calling themselves Croken Poets. But the thing was, really? you know, I walked in the door and I was like, it was like my people. Because, you know, I said back in elementary school, we were bussed around. I had started out at this elementary school in West Gainesville, where honestly, back then, I was this little country kid. And I didn't really relate. All the kids in town were a lot more cool and savvy. And I just didn't fit in. You know, my dad died while I was there. I did, it was just a bad few years. Yeah. But fast forward, while I had been bussed around, I started playing boys club football with all those guys. And we became buddies. We played five years together. And I played with Ken's younger brother, Jeffrey, who unfortunately died from leukemia. And actually, there's a sister Hazel tune called Running Through the Fields. It's about Jeffrey. Well, Jeffrey and I were teammates. He was like my best friend on the team. So Ken was a little older than us. He kind of became like a big brother. Mm -hmm. So there was a bond and a friendship. And so coming back and seeing those guys who had nothing to do with like formalized, none of them were like studying music, you know, like we've done. Mm -hmm. And all the guys I worked with at Disney were the North Texas, Indiana, you know, Miami, all the big Berkeley, you know, and, and, and I had, I couldn't relate to them. I could relate to these guys and they're just playing music for the love of it and writing songs. That was a big one. Like the idea of songwriting, they were all huge James Taylor, Carol King fans right. and Ken, especially and Ken, I mean, Ken went on and got his grad. By that point, I think he already had it. He'd gotten his graduate degree in psychology. I mean, he's a smart, smart dude. I tease him all the time. Like when you running for governor, <laughs> you know, but that's, and again, he's the lead singer of Sister Hazel. You know, if you ever, it's hard to say what is, that's Ken. You know, he wrote, he wrote that song in like 90 or something when I was playing or before I was even playing with those guys. But that, by finding that group of friends yeah. and then juxtaposing that to what I had learned out at Disney about, oh, like if you're serious about music, you've really got to diversify. These, like, these guys, you know, I'm playing with trombone players who worked with, you know, the Woody Herman revival band, or and some of them went on to be in Harry Connick's band. John uh, Joe Verratti, so I think, still plays bass trombone whenever Harry does his big band, and I think he works with Michael Puble too. Wow. And these dudes are monster musicians. So I was around those guys. I had no business being around them. I mean, I know it bugged the heck out of them that doofus me was making the same money they were. <laughs> you know? So, but that's the that was the first place that I began to understand that networking and that connectivity that like, man, life's going to put you in these places 
and you can't force it. Some, some, you've got to be okay with like, you know, people call it failing. I don't believe in failing. It's just trial and error. It's maybe it's a place you fit or you don't. I mean, if you haven't been fired in our business for something, <laughs> you're, you're pretty amazing to start yeah. with. And I've got people who haven't, some people are just, they're just great fits. Me, good Lord. I teach a class on how to get fired, <laughs> you know, whether it's Disney, Sideman artists, you know. Change is inevitable in our business. <laughs> Like the, what's the they say about the NFL for is not for long, uh, I, you know, I think that's the same thing in music. And that's why coming all the way back, kind of tying that art to back when you say to a student that's coming up the pike is like you said, if you told me I would be the drummer for like this stone cold country guy who's like, I mean, he you can't stump him on country music. Tracy Lawrence is he would kill anybody on like one of those Jeopardy shows, name that tune or something. He knows everything. He knows the first chord. Oh, that's him. Blah, 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 blah. That's, you know, you're, you know, Gene, Gene Watson, blah, 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 this album. I mean, Tracy's unreal. And that's why he hosts the show he does. Mm -hmm. But if you told me that would be the longest gig I would have in my life as a professional musician going on eight years now, you know, and he laughs about how little I know about country. I mean, I, you know, I know like Kitty Rogers, I know Dolly, you know, I know like, you know, oh yeah, yeah, Eddie Rabbit, I, mean, I love Randy Nutt. <laughs> but he starts talking about 90s country, John Michael Montgomery, I'm like, I don't know, I don't care. <laughs> you know, I was playing rock and pop and I was talking about Miles Davis' Bitches Brew. I wasn't talking about, you know, because again, now that's the funny thing is that I'm Jethro out of Disney that knows nothing and all these guys are jazz guys and they, now, I am that guy. Now I'm the snobby guy going, oh, I can't believe you don't know impressions by John Coltrane. You know, and so I have to call it like I, I catch myself with my students. I'm going, hey, hey, Jethro, you might want to check in with yourself and remember who you really are. Mr. I, I remember telling them, well, I like Rush. I like the police. And they're like, you don't know who Lee Morgan is? You've never heard of Maud Jamal? You know, so uh, I mean, it's a weird juxtaposition of Trevor Park Jethro getting with all these worldly jazz musicians, then coming back and jamming with all my songwriter friends and doing being part of the whole 90s. I mean, we were, you know, I was there. Heck, I mean, I've known Rob Thomas from Matchbox 20 since he was singing in bars down Sloppy Joe's in downtown Orlando. Right. You know, now he's the big producer pop star, you know, that's done stuff with Santana, but it's so crazy to me because it's just, I didn't make any of that happen. I just kind of showed up and I kept showing up. Yeah. Um, and I will steal one thing uh, from my friend, Troy, if he's uh, it's a shameless name drop, but you remember the band, the rock band Tesla, right? Sure, of course. Troy Lucetta, he lives here in Nashville now. Mm -hmm. Well, Troy was, you know, Back in those days, I, I couldn't stand hair bands. I was out having to play all that stuff. I kind of liked White Snake; they're pretty cool. But I, I had been around those Disney guys just enough to be a total snob and like, oh, these bands suck. You know, that was kind of my arrogant way. And, so, and then I heard Tesla, I'm like, now these dudes are cool. These boys can play, you know. And so Troy has always been a hero. And so years ago, we became friends once he was here, and I had him on Loud Jams. And Troy has this saying: he has, and you know, they were managed by Journey's manager. I mean, those guys, their career is incredible. But right. Troy's one thing he goes by through everything he's ever done in his life. And he's been through the highs and the lows. He says, man, my saying is, you could say one thing about Troy. He says, if I'm talking about myself in third person, he said, I show up. I always show up. If I say I'm going to do something, I show up. And I mean, again, I would say this about you. I'd say that about Rich Viano, right? I mean, if Rich says he's doing something, he mm -hmm. shows up. Yep. And I can't always say that. There have been times where I have definitely dropped the ball. I mean, in college, professionally, but generally I try to go, no matter, even if I feel like I'm totally out of my depth, Mm -hmm. Man, just when the net will appear, you know, take that leap. And that's coming back to students and that authenticity in your networking. Mm -hmm. I, I, there's the, the network will appear just through your own openness, being willing to lay yourself bare and be like, hey, look, here are my flaws. I've got all these areas I'm not good in. You know, here's the area I've worked on and I'm just but I'm open to improvement. Right. I think that's the, the biggest thing is, you know, like I hear you talk with your students at Auburn, you know, the idea of just just don't be afraid to try new things. Mm -hmm. you know, that's easier said than done. We all, you know, we, I can say that all day, but I'll, boy, I'll be over here clinging to what I know I'm good at, or at least I think I am, you know? Sure, because everyone's afraid, you know, to try new things and afraid to be bad at something. I heard something just recently where they were talking about embracing the suck, right? Yes. You know, you have to be willing to go, okay, I may be oh. bad at this, but I'm going to bring everything I have on this and I'm going to get good really quick. And I think that's the thing, like you were saying, you got to show up, you got to bring a hundred percent of you. Yeah. Time. 
everybody that you know the cool thing about embracing the suck is it's I, they use the old uh, glass analogy of you know how hard it is like somebody as a vocalist for you to make improvement as a vocalist you're you that that glass has got a lot of experience and, and talent and work in there so you're just adding little increments right you know kind of topping it off the beauty of the suck when you're coming to something totally new like me at piano i mean there's nowhere to go but up you know and it's fun like accidentally going oh man i didn't go oh yeah that's back in college they were talking about those sus chords that's oh that's a sus chord hey that theory stuff i was terrible at back in undergrad you know it actually makes sense now man that sounds cool that's why they wanted me to practice that for oral skills <laughs> So, yeah, I, I love that term. Embrace the suck and don't be afraid to fall flat on your face. I, I mean, I've, you know, and I say that, but I can still remember being in Orlando. I would not go out. They, the guys, all those jazz musicians again. And it was, I keep saying guys, it's just all dudes. They're, they're, I can't, I cannot hardly. Beth, Beth Golly, I name her a percussionist, incredible percussionist. She's like the only woman I worked with at the parks that I can think of, you know, in those days, this 87 to 92, 91, whatever yeah. I and those, a lot of the musicians kind of took a liking to me. They're like, Jethro, you're not very good, but you're a good guy, you know? So they would invite, and I would go out to the jazz jams in downtown Orlando, and all these killer players are there. Well, they'd be like, Jethro, why don't you play a tune? You know, it's never Tom, it's always Jethro. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, dude, no way, man. They're like, oh, come on, Tom, you know, you know, and it means something, you know, like it could be freedom jazz dance, something that wasn't that hard. And it was like, they right. knew me rock funk guy they knew i couldn't swing <laughs> you know but they're like they're like tom you could play this it's funky and i'm like no man not in front of y'all and i was so intimidated of them i would not get up and play and it was so foolish of me because i was you know and then you know and then there were times that i did try and play in certain settings where i wasn't amongst those friends trying to play jazz and i did get embarrassed i was i was terrible but you know what you begin to realize is like oh, sun still came up nobody you know i still get i still have my other job and, <laughs> and and you know what happened for me i went from that probably in 87 to 80 88 the group i was in got laid off disney had a big cut back and i went to university of north florida for a year or so with rich madison and i did learn to swing i mean i got they i got what i needed i got to i lucked out all those north texas guys connected me with rich and rich was like you know man you got a good feel that was the one thing on me they all said they're like jethro's got feel they're like, guy's got a pocket. You know, they're like, no, he didn't have a clue. Like, if you put a Stan Kenton chart in front of him, he's going to suck. You know, I barely find my way through it. But I could, I just had a sound on the drums and a feel. That's the one thing all the horn players told me. They're like, man, you listen, you got good ears. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, you do. <laughs> and see, so Rich embraced that. And so here, all of a sudden, I'm with Rich Madison and, you know, and uh, uh, Bunky wasn't there yet, but uh, Bill Prince. I mean, he's some legendary teachers. And they were kind enough. They could see how clueless I was, but they're like, well, you just haven't taken these classes. You just need to learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Palmer, I can't think of his first name now. He was the vocal guy there. That guy, he and his wife took me under their wing for theory. I, forever, and he's great, you know, great. Mm -hmm. And, and I had, it wasn't like I didn't have a great high school band director. Martha Stark, my director, rest her soul, she passed away in the 90s. She's like, there's an award in Florida and FBA. Some of their biggest awards are the, Mar the Martha Stark Award. She was incredible. It's just I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, was, I was too busy. I'm gonna march drum corps, man. I don't need all that theory stuff. I'm gonna play rudiments. I play fast. And you know, so thankfully, by being at, at North Ford and being in those settings, I was able to truly embrace my personal suck and throw it out there, though. Like, but go that uh, I had a lot of peers. I was finally with people my own age who were still learning the process, and it was okay to fail. Right. I was, I was all kind of ass backwards. I'm at Disney World with all these pros. Who it's man? And ain't no one got time to watch you learn. Exactly, <laughs> you know, yeah. If you're a tower power chart in front of you, they're all like, "Oh yeah, of course. What is hip? I've heard it a million times." You know? <laughs> and there's me like, "Who's this tower of what?" <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, that's literally it. I mean, and the band I was in, T Bone Brass, we do Tower Power, Earth, Wind, and Fire. To these guys, I was like falling out of bed. They had played in college, you know, yeah. bands, and me, it's new music. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> go ahead. That's part of the, I think, part of the really great thing about putting yourself, especially in that position, you with older, more experienced musicians. I think that's great for younger musicians. Absolutely. I, I was just lucky. I, I, my college, or excuse me, my high school drumline instructor, Paul Rorig, who was a student at the University of Florida, Paul's who got me out of Disney. He got me there because, you know, I was playing in the Gainesville High drum line and I'd gotten fairly decent. You know, I, I was lucky. Again, just peers. You know, And we had really good people like Paul and that got him Randy Shop off. We had all these guys who had uh, marched with like Suncoast Sound, Drum Review, of course, Spirit of Atlanta. Miss Stark had great people working with us. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any better. I was still so into racing my bike. I was way more interested in BMX. I was 
playing football and racing BMX. And then it was like, oh yeah, I'll do the drumline thing, whatever. And, you know, Tom, play snare. Okay. <laughs> you know? And, but that, that being said, thanks to Paul, he's, he, for whatever reason, he even years later joked about, he said, I should never have told you because <laughs> we ended up living together. Like when I was in the full-time band and it drove him nuts. Cause he had like, you know, 18 year old me who had no, you can imagine as a roommate, <laughs> you know? but he, he, for some reason said, you know, Hey Tom, man, you ought to come out to this Disney audition they're doing over at, you know, at school. And it was mostly, they were, you know, they go to the universities, Florida state, UF and Miami pretty much. And maybe you, uh, South Florida, USF in those days. And they would they would audition for student musicians for the uh, the holiday season at Disney. It's that that Christmas parade, Kathy Lee and uh, mm -hmm. Christmas morning. Sure. Well, that runs, that would run for two weeks, all during the Christmas break, so to speak. And they would have musicians would all be either mostly college, a few high school students. You know, maybe mostly the high school ones would be usually from the Orlando area. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, this Dan Stamper, who used to hire everybody back then, took a liking to me. He you know he asked me to improvise, and and Paul had giving me a little heads up because Paul had already done it years ago. He said, Hey, look, don't play a bunch of drum line snare drum stuff. He wants to hear you groove. Do what you do. He's I've heard you play drum set. And so I think I sat on the rim and like play and I kind of just grooved along and kind of bopped around. And I saw Dan kind of look up from the sheet. He'd been totally ignoring me because you know he's hearing kids all day. He looks up and he's watching me and I'm I'm goofing, you know, just jamming. I I was just he improvised. I was like, well this is what I this is how I play drum set. So I'm gonna do this. And it got me into job. It, I mean, and, you know, at those days, I think it paid like almost $9 an hour. You know, I've been working at Publix and Albertsons for like three twenty-five. I was like, how much are you going to pay me to play drums? <laughs> and they're like, well, yeah, and then we pay you time and a half on the holidays and you get, you know, you get in the parks for free, of course, you'll be, and you'll be status at Disney. So you'll be able to come to the parks for free anytime all year. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Back in those days, casual temporary is what we call CT. You like they kept you on, and this is the crazy thing, Jill, is that they once they put me in the in the system back in 1985 when I got hired. They never took you out. If as long as you came back at least once during the year, so I would do Christmas and Easter. Once you kind of were in the mix, you knew you'd probably get hired again. They'd bring you back as long as you didn't do anything stupid. And I did some dumb stuff with all the other guys, but fortunately nothing too bad. <laughs> like we jumped in the fountain our last day in Jungle Band and played in front of a um, what's the we literally did our last set out in the fountain in front of um, Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah, uh, middle management was none too happy with us. <laughs> I can imagine that was not a popular decision. <laughs> yeah. But but it, the whole point of that was that that was the first, thanks to Paul, if Paul doesn't take that chance, I think my life is completely different. Because I was enjoying music, but, you know, my mom was super supportive. She was fine with like, hey, do this music thing. If you're getting paid to do it, great. But I was the one like, well, that's not legitimate. You know, my family, you got to go get a degree, you know. And I was always like, gosh, I'll never be. I used to drive. I mean, I grew up driving past the University of Florida. I thought they'll never let me in. And they didn't initially because my grades weren't that good. I was like, A, B, some C's, maybe a D, <laughs> you know. And it was. And so I went to Santa Fe, as we call it, Santa Play, you know, back then. <laughs> but and I just sort of took, took this super circuitous path because I end up, I do one year of community college. And suddenly I'm at Disney World, you know, working in a full time job. I mean, I'm like, I literally because. I jumped ahead, but the group that after I did the the the, uh, the student stuff for the years while I was in high school and starting college, I got called literally the day I was supposed to start classes in my sophomore year at Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. Paul calls me again, eight thirty in the morning, and by now I had earned the name Jethro. They all called me Jay. He's like Jethro, what are you doing today? I'm uh, like getting ready to go to school today. He's like it's first day, right? I said yeah. He says you can miss it. You want a full time job? And I'm like what are you talking about? He says. And, and he, by this point, the band that we had played, the where I, we jumped in the fountain, the yeah. <laughs> band, Disney decided they liked that group. It was called the Jungle Band, and they turned it into a full time band at Epcot Center uh, in probably in 1986. Well, Paul was, you know, got the job to be in it because he had been one of the founding members of the, the Student Jungle Band, and they took a lot of those guys, and then they auditioned and brought in some real ringer horn players, a lot of North Texas trombone players. And it's like eight trombones, two tubas, and three drums. Well, that group, their bass drummer, was moving to one of the other groups in part oh. and having auditions. And literally, this is the morning of the audition. Could you be down here by like, you know, by noon today? You know, it's like 8.30. I'm like, uh, okay. And I, I said, well, let me ask my mom. I'm still living at home. I was just, I was like first year of college. So I'm just living it out. Uh, mom, what do you think? Can I, can I, uh, could my car didn't run that well. Can I borrow your car? <laughs> Cause she had a truck for the county that she drove us in. And she said, she said, is this one of those full-time jobs there? I said, yeah. She says, does it have benefits? I said, yeah. She says, well, you take your butt to Orlando. <laughs> so she says, Thomas, you can go to community college in Orlando. <laughs> so again, props to law for being 
Carol, Carol Hurst, my mom, man, she, she always has been in my corner on this stuff. And she's not like, oh, your music is so great. She's not that person. She's like, can you make money doing it? Awesome. Go get it. <laughs> and so between her and Paul and I'm out, again, I go down there, Jill, I'm auditioning against my, the, one of the guys in the audition was my former section leader from Florida Wave Drum and Bugle Corps, who I had just marched with two years prior, named Jim Lucier. And I mean, Jim like kicked my butt up and down the path on a snare drum. And I'm like, oh, I have no chance. So Jim's there and there's the other guys. And I'm looking around and it's like, I know who they all are because from my days as a student musician, I'm like, oh, this is silly. I'm okay. I'm, and I, you know what I did? It took all the pressure off. I'm like, oh, screw it. I'm just going to have fun. So when it came my turn, it's for bass drum. Basically, we're like the dirty dozen brass band. So I get on the bass, I get on this, they have these two bass drums and where, and there's a high and a low. And I see the chart. And by this point, you know, I at least had been at the parks. I knew kind of how to read their music. I was familiar with, you know, Disney calligraphy. I know what to expect. That's the one advantage I had on people like Jim. He had never worked for the company. I knew that they weren't freaks about that. They really wanted to make sure that you listened and didn't get in the way, especially rhythm section. Like, man, just... Mm -hmm fit and groove, you know, and, and be, you know, know where you are, but also perform. And that was the thing I knew. I knew that all the, all the Disney brass are in there. There's like Ronnie Rodriguez and Dan Stamper and Bob Franklin, all these people that are the Dave Urig, all these hiring guys who I know what they look for. They want you to turn it on. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, screw it. Here I go. And I, and I got, and I mean, to the point that I could tell the guys, some of the guys in the band are like, you know, geez, just wrote, he's up, man. <laughs> but Jim, who fast forward and went on, I don't think he's too sad he left, didn't get the gig. He went on to be a captain. I think he's retired now for Delta. <laughs> he's like, he, he's, he did just fine. He, he loves to tease me. He's like, I think I made the better career choice. I'm like, oh, I agree. I think you did. But Jim said he, he had already, I think he had played already. And he watched, and he said he watched the band react to me. He says, the oh. band turned on. He says, all of a sudden, you can tell they had just been kind of reading the charts. And he says, you got in the van. And everyone's like, Jethro, yeah, man. He says, he says, I knew I was not getting the gig. And even I, at the time, I still can remember that thinking, well, gosh, man, these other guys are so much better than me as drum set players. But for this job, I think I'm the right guy. And sure enough, I mean, they, they hired me. And, you know, and, and oh, God, for the next two next year or so until they, the group got laid off, they regretted it because I was such a big goofball. You know, I was busy playing quarters with my friends till two o'clock in the morning, barely making the first set, you know, at 10 o'clock. Oh, I don't know if I can get up that early to make the 10 o'clock, you know, hit in the park. <laughs> so it wasn't like I was the most professional, but I at least, you know, again, opportunity knocked. And it was like, you know, just, I, I just was kind of like, man, I guess this is where I'm supposed to be. And, and that, you know, when you think about it, if I think of an overarching, I almost have never done what I thought I would do. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, to this day, I like, I, you know, joke about the Sting thing, but I always thought if I was going to be a pro, I'm going to play in rock and pop. I've hardly done that. Mm -hmm. I've been drumming for country artists for 22 years now. Right. But it, but it, you've had steady work in something you love. And again, I think it comes back to your ability to, as you did in that audition, to show up, even yeah. if you feel like maybe, um, you know, going in, we all are, you know, I mean, we're all going, oh, I don't know if I'm right for this or, oh, you know, but, but the fact that you showed up and you said, you know what, I'm going to do what I know I need to do. And you did it. And you've consistently done that. You've worked as a professional musician your whole career. That's, you know, I, I, as you said that it made me, I, I flashed to the day of driving in from Orlando up to Troy to do the, the populist day with y'all. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, I, what I knew of you, I know Jeff, you know, I have so much respect for Jeff for his whole pedigree and drum corps. And of course, Robert, you know, as a guy who marched in Suncoast Sound, I mean, Robert was like, you know, up on, on the mountain to me. Okay. And, and you know what I mean? And I'm driving in. It, the difference is I've had that experience so many times of like that total trepidation, just like all you can do is be like, oh, well, they asked you to come dive in, give it your best shot, do what you can do. And, you know, and it is, it's like this. I mean, I'm such a babbling brook. I'm all over the path. But the one thing I do know is that if you just trust yourself, you know, what's the worst? Okay. If somebody doesn't, you can't please everybody. First off, mm -hmm. that's another one I try and drive home to younger students. It's like, if you're not, uh, I'll borrow from my friend, Chris next, he talks about when he writes music, he's like, I'm not going to write music trying to please somebody else. Because if, if they don't like it, if I tried that and I didn't like it, you know, what was the point? You know, so he always says his saying, and I love it. And we, it's with the power triplets, Chris, Chris is the, he's definitely the creative force behind the power triplets as his trip. Wamsley, our bass player, you know, and I sort of try and get in there and make some drum rocket in between, but 
the, the two of them are two of the most completely pure creators I've ever worked with because they do not care about what anybody else thinks. They legitimately are trying to be the best them. They're trying to find who's in here. And for me, if you've ever read that book, uh, I, I don't know how you say it, Ayn Rand or Ayn Rand, A-Y-N, right. The Fountain. Yeah. You know, I, I, there's Howard Rourke as her protagonist or whatever you call the, 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 the featured guy. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, he is so pure in his vision of what, and he, and even in an iconoclastic way that he will not waver. I mean, and it, it can aggravate people because he won't fit into a box because he, he's not going to settle. And there's, I think the other guy, the other character's name is like Peter something, Peter Keating, I believe, because I remember, I love this book. Mm -hmm. And because I honestly, I kind of embarrassingly kind of felt like I, I, call my, I feel like more like Peter Keating. I feel like I try to please everybody. I try and I'm trying to fit in, you know, and ironically, you know, I'm saying on one side, I'm over here. Oh, heck with it. Just give it, you know, be you. But I admittedly am concerned with what others think. And I'm not proud of that. It's one of those things where I'm like, gosh, I wish I would let, not let it bother me. Yeah. But fortunately I have just enough of the effort, <laughs> if you will, side to me that is like, eh, I'll worry, 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 worry right up, but I'm still going to go. I've always, I, and I think it was, I read this book in the nineties when I was on the road. I was got, I got, I had met a guy in the Navy SEALs. We played in Norfolk and I didn't know what the Navy SEALs were in the early nineties. And this guy, Mike, who is a drummer, he, you know, we played in Little Creek. Turns out Little Creek is the base for the Navy, all the Eastern command for Navy SEALs. And this bar, Skippers, that we were playing in in like 92, 93 was a SEAL hangout. The whole place is special forces guys. Wow. Uh, and it's so funny because we'd always come from Camp Lejeune where there'd be fights all the time in the bar. You know, they get money and all the Marines and they're great. I love the Marine Corps guys. God, man, I got nothing but love for those guys. They're just amazing. They all want to tell you about when they had long hair and they rock their guitar. They're the best dudes. But they, they'd be beating the crap out of each other once they get drinking. So we'd pretty much be like, I'm going to stay on stage and let the Force Recon guys break it up. But we would always play that club for a week and then we'd move to up to skippers and skippers was run by this guy from jersey or new york i swear he had to be mobbed up but god he loved us he loved and this is isis this is our dumb rock band he loved us because we'd play toto and rush and then play oh. neil diamond and metallica and this bar was much more subdued they were all real chill and there were never fights or anything it was i was like what's with the navy these navy dudes are like one of the guys is like you know i get to know this mike guy who's doing the door he said well we're, we're we do a different branch of the navy <laughs> You know, and this is before seals were like ubiquitous. I mean, it's the early nineties. I didn't know what a seal was. I'm like, yeah, the guys. He's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> He's like, we're sc we scuba dive and stuff. So I get to know Mike. And the funny thing is, is that with that, you know, by being around those guys, I, I started reading up. I wanted to know what, what's this UDT in Navy SEAL. So I read this book by a guy named Richard Marchenko who had founded SEAL Team 6. And in Richard March, I think it's Marchenko is the one who he used the phrase leap and the net will appear. That yeah. that's one of the things he always encouraged his guys, you know, that they to be that, you know, they got to be, man, if you're going to do those guys have got to be able to count on each other. That's why buds, you know, basic underwater demolition school is so merciless. They cannot, they don't care, man. You're going to, you know, it's life and death. So if you can't make it through, you know, respect to you. There's no disrespect. You're just not cut for it. There's, right. there's no shame in like ring the bell, you know, but we want the guys who will not ring that bell. They'd rather die. And mm -hmm. so, I don't mean to like align myself in any way, shape or form. My point is, is I realize all this that we're doing is not that important. So if I'm ever feeling really stressed about who I am or what somebody thinks about me or, well, I didn't get that recording session because this bass player doesn't think I'm that good. Oh, well, who cares? I'm not doing brain surgery. I'm not a Navy SEAL. <laughs> I play drums. You know, I, I don't want to take myself too seriously is my whole point. And, then, and I also don't want to be afraid to take the leap, you know, that, hey, try something new. I mean, as we sit here right now, you and I have talked about it. I'm fortunate to do the things we do with teaching and such, but you know, I've been very much considering Tracy and I've talked about it. I, I probably have that conversation with him a few times a year, like, well, boss, man, we can probably find you someone better. You know, I'm always trying to fire myself. I'm like, man, have you seen these young guys? They're amazing. Only, only because I kind of feel like I've had my turn. I care about that kid coming out of Auburn or somewhere. That's an amazing young drummer. I'm like, you know what, man, I've done thousands of shows coming off a tour bus. Yeah. all I wanted to do. I just wanted to be able to go have that experience. And I've gotten to go to Singapore and Europe and not like to blow my own horn. I'm saying I've had my fair share. Yeah. It's someone else's turn. So at 52, I'm big on like, get out of the way. There's, mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I'd rather be a guy that is maybe a mentor to that young guy or young gal that, you know, in the beauty of it now in drumming, you see lots of awesome young women too. It's not just a yep. boy show anymore. Absolutely. Amazing drummers. 
So I want those people to have that opportunity and I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is and take that leap again in a different direction. Now for me, it's working in other areas that I'm honestly kind of clueless in, whether it's academia or even other kind of music related, but business type stuff. But you know, it's like, hey, some point you got to try. I mean, what's the worst case? I mean, I, I've got a good mower. I can always mow grass for people. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think it's going to come to that, Tom. <laughs> well, it is funny because that's, that's what Nick's gets on me on. He's like, dude, do not go get seven other jobs. He says, you're supposed to be making music, Tom, or teaching music. Do something. His thing is like, it has to do with, if you're not on a drum, either with a microphone on it, recording or performing or teaching someone how to do so, he says, don't you do it. <laughs> Because <laughs> like, he knows me, I'll go get other jobs. I'm quick to fire myself. I'm quick to be like, ah, oh, I'm not that good. I'll, you know, and thankfully, I think what getting to the student that's trying to figure out what to do today, the beauty of it, Jilla, is that they do have technology. They have this. You and I, we couldn't do this, man. I, I think the live performance thing, while it may be going away, I think there's an entire new realm coming. Not, And it's not just a Zoom meeting. It's not as much no. as we tired of being on them. I mean, anybody and everybody can broadcast what they're doing to the world. And I know that can be bad, too, because maybe, the, you know, the quality, you know, some things are good, some are bad. But I ascribe to the idea that there's somebody out there that's going to probably dig what you do. Exactly. exactly. And somebody's plural. So that's the that's the part that I think in terms of the networking, the connectivity piece and the career arc is that as long as you're willing to, to let, you know, kind of put yourself out there fearlessly, and, and, you know, do your due diligence, you know, do your homework as to the best of your ability and keep reinventing yourself. Hey, who knows where you, where you can go? You know, just don't have a preconception of I have to get this job, you know, because everyone tells me like, so I'm ready to move to Nashville. Why? <laughs> you have a comfortable, so I've got a student in Birmingham who's a, he's got a great scene down there. He's got all, I'm like, there's no one stopping you on I-65 to drive up and come play some gigs on lower Broadway and go home. Right. I mean, you're just dying to live in Nashville. That's cool. Okay, come on down. But know why you're doing it. You know, I, I commuted here for years from Gainesville, Florida. I mean, sometimes weekly just to play the Opry because I had something bringing me here. Right. I, I, tell, I tell them all the time. I'm like, hey, you can come work on Lower Broadway tomorrow, tonight, probably. Put your name on the thing. Someone will hire you. Well, mm -hmm. you know, at, at normal times. But that's the thing. It's like, don't completely throw your life into upheaval. Keep your options open, as I guess is what I'm trying to get at. And by all means, you have the luxury that if you're within five hours of Nashville, I mean, I was driving eight, you mm -hmm. know, not that bad. You know, I mean, I mean it's, you're not, you're not going to drive to LA. You're not probably driving to New York, but Nashville's pretty convenient for a lot of the country. So I, I kind of go, I talk out of both sides of my mouth. I'm like, by all means, get yourself in the mix. I mean, the class I teach at UNA, I make them one of their assignments is they have to reach out to 10 musicians not on their instrument in the Nashville area. You have to look them up on social media and find, and I said, you, a hint, hint, you could start with my 5,000 friends, <laughs> you, know, you know, friends, quote unquote, air quotes. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, don't, you, don't limit yourself. Who knows? You might end up in Los Angeles for all, you know, you Cirque du Soleil, you know, if, you know, you know, reforms and you, you get to go to Russia with them. But at, at, none of that's going to happen if you don't at least put up, hang your shingle out there, you know, the virtual shingle and let them know you're here. And that's a lot of the old guys, old drummers my age are all like real quick to poo poo all over these young Instagram drummers that are like blowing notes all over, you know, on their videos and they do a video every day. I'm like, hey, man, it's the world they live in. They, it's how they get themselves out there. Whether we think they're good, bad, or otherwise, you know, no one's really looking for gray haired 52 year old guy to play for, you know, Susie that just came out of the, you know, out of college. She, she yeah. doesn't really, you know, doubt it's doubtful. She wants me to play drums for her. She may dig that, <laughs> you know, and that's how he's letting her know he's there to do it or for Jimmy jam, you know, that's yeah. three chords in the truth, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I so appreciate all of your time and your insights because you know, for, for students coming out, just hearing other people and, and hearing about their journey and, and what they think and what they've found to be important. I want to thank you so much. Oh, um, you. As we wrap this up, can you give us the top three things that you think you would say to musicians? Oh, gosh. Uh, in terms of like... A anything that you think is really just important for them to hear or know about oh, being no a musician. Problem. I, I definitely, I think we're kind of, we've, they've kind of been our theme today. I would say, you know, you know, again, to use that term tabula rasa, be a, be a blank slate, 
you know, in terms of receptivity, or if that's even a word, how you re you receive ideas. Mm -hmm. I, I think, and I guess what I would say, again, learning from what not to do, some of the things I did when I was younger, once I got a little established and I got kind of, kind of full of myself, don't be defensive, take critic, take, you know, it's, it's all constructive. I don't care if somebody comes at you and tells you you're, you're an idiot and you're terrible and everything. I, I've literally had a, a musical director do that to me on a cruise ship out in Hawaii. And, you know, he ended up like by, by two months later, like telling me how he wish he could keep me on because he, how much he liked my drumming. You know, they just understand that even people's, and this is so hard for me. I'm such a Sagittarius, man. I'm ready to like put on the gloves and go when you, when you confront me. But then two minutes later, I want to apologize. So, so the, the, I, I'm trying to say to anybody, to a, a musician is to say, Hey, just, just, you know, put your subjugate your ego put it aside no one cares what you have or haven't done meaning both ways cut yourself some slack don't be afraid to try and be you know just be open but in terms of those three things it's definitely i think it's openness and receptivity to new ideas you know constantly be a perpetual student never ever ever stop learning i think that is the Thing I most enjoy about this. I don't care if I do another gig. I've had, I don't know how many times, I'm sure you've had this question posed to you many times. Don't you miss it this year? Don't you? No, man. To be perfectly honest, I have not missed dragging out to another cornfield or some track. And, I'm, and again, that sounds so ungrateful. I'm not saying I'm, I'm so glad I got to do this stuff, but you know, it's like any other job. It gets kind of, you know, you know, there's a big difference, you know, when you get to go play in Singapore, that's exciting. Playing with Wang Chung in Singapore, that was cool. <laughs> Thank you, Tiffany. You know, that was cool too. You know, they, I mean, those are rare, but the point being is that I, what I have enjoyed is the chance to improve and to be, mm -hmm. to get better and the, and the chance to learn from peers and colleagues. So by being open and receptive to new ideas and being willing to try and constantly, imp, you know, improve myself. And then the third one, it kind of, I don't know if this is third or different, but it's, it's also don't, don't underestimate, you know, or, or excuse me, I guess it's like, you don't need to, uh, don't need to put in a box, you know, where you get your inspiration, be open to inspiration from anybody, because I learned so much from our students. They inspire me. I mean, if I didn't, I'd miss out on snarky puppy. I'd miss out on dirty loops. I'd miss out on all these. Amazing, I mean, you know, they make me, I watched them and I watched snarky puppy and go, <laughs> okay, I guess that lawn mowing gig, I should get on that. <laughs> you know, Larnell Lewis seems like he's forgotten more about drumming than I'm ever going to learn. But right. It's not, it's not competition, man. It's like, I love watching those cats. I mean, uh, Corey Henry, he's not a, he's a keyboard player. You know, I'm sure he kills drums too, but like, I love their spirit and I don't want to miss out on it. And this comes all the way back to our conversation about the social component of like what I would miss out on if I didn't have my friends who'd grown up in, you know, in African-American culture, my friends who were Cuban and Hispanic, you know, whatever Hispanic where it's Colombia or I mean, my girlfriend at the time that was from Venezuela, I learned more about music. You know, it's, it's again, be, uh, you know, kind of be a, uh, be an open citizen of the world and be, and you know, and I'm not always this person. I'm just as guilty as anybody else of like getting, you know, if I get, I get threatened, I get defensive, but I just try and keep knocking that barrier down, you know, realize, hey, 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 get rid of that facade and be genuine. You know, anyone that's worked with me on a tour bus can tell you, oh, Tom can be such a jerk. Absolutely. I get defensive and insecure. Let that stuff go. Just let the, you know, I, I think that would be number four, or number three, or insecurity, do away with it in yeah. every facet of your life, your relationships with those you love, you know, and I, I say this and I am terrible at implementing it. I try every day to start anew, but just remember oh. It's a practice, just like everything else, just like life and our careers and our, it's all a practice. We have to keep practicing. So that saying, always, you know, forever striving, never arriving. I mean, I, you know, that, I feel like that's what I'm trying to do is to kind of call, call BS on myself and go, Hey, 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 check yourself there, Jethro, you know, <laughs> who you are, where you came. but also like my mom says, don't be so hard on yourself too. There's that other side, you know, like be it, compassionate with yourself. Yeah, just 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 be gentle and like go. Hey, it's okay. I screwed up. You know, be well, be be authentic in your in your apologies. You know, try and shower people with genuine love. You know, I'm probably sometimes I probably come off as disingenuous, and I hope people that know me know I I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I'm just really grateful that they put up with me. Is you know, it's kind of you know, <laughs> friends like you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, I am so glad that you are a friend of mine and that you are in my life, and and I you know we can work together and and have a friendship and do other things. There's gosh, there's so much we didn't get to talk about today. Maybe uh, we will come back. <laughs> Um, I, I want to talk about community service. I want to talk about your BMX, your riding, um, all of the loud jams. Oh my gosh, there's so much we didn't cover today, but I, I can't. Have me back. I love, I love to babble. 
<laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Tom Hurst. And I'm going to add uh, just a ton of links in the show notes for everybody. So uh, hopefully you will be back and we will have much, much more to discuss. It's a pleasure, Jill. I love you, my friend. You're awesome. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us today. You know, building your best life and career is about finding balance in everything you do. So build your life on purpose and you'll find success, happiness, and peace. And remember, whatever stage you're on today, walk with purpose.